big honor tonight of an exclusive TV interview with Lady Thatcher. She was Prime Minister of Great Britain for 11 and a half years, from 1979 to 1990. The Iron Lady, they called her. Margaret Thatcher was the only Prime Minister of Britain to triumph in three successive elections in 160 years. She rescued Britain from a deep economic slump. She sent the British fleet to throw back the Argentine invasion of the Falklands, and she stamped her name on the West's spectacular victory over communism in the Cold War. Newsweek magazine named her the world's outstanding woman in 1995, a full five years after Margaret Thatcher stepped down. All in all, a remarkable woman and a remarkable leader. Well, Winnie, I think uh, this interview of Firing Line with uh, Margaret Thatcher will set a precedent for Firing Line. Oh, oh and you get to have all the fun. <laughs> you, are, you are such a lucky son of a gun. <laughs> That you're going to be, you're going to have this opportunity of picking her brains because this lady yeah. is talagang my idol. Not not necessarily that we hold the same views, yeah. but she's got such a keen mind and she's, she is so principled. And what's more, she doesn't hesitate to call a spade a spade. So uh. talagang <laughs> believe na believe ako sa kanya at ingit na ingit ako sa iyo na ikaw lang ang makaka, makakatanong ng questions sa kanya. Al That's the only thing that I have against her. Why <laughs> Why is she only allowing one person to interview him? And that's sure a fact, no? Huh? When I was reading three books on Margaret Thatcher, uh -uh. many of her characteristics struck me. Ika ko, si Winnie ganito rin eh. <laughs> wow, Malakas. ayan ang talagang compliment. Very, very strong ang kanyang character. Ate. She does not hesitate to say what she says in the presence of men. You know what she did? She lectured Brezhnev. At well, the Kremlin, huh? Alam mo, kasi yeah. this lady, you know, one of the best quotations I ever mm. heard, read from her was this, huh? She said, you want to have a matter studied, you give it to the men. Mm. You want to have a matter done, mm. you give it to the women. <laughs> uh, so I said, talagang, this is a woman after my own heart. But do you notice, talagang strong. Very strong. And, and not stubborn, it's just that she, as, uh, well, let's, let's find out what she has to say about, about herself later on, but... But uh, anyone who has, who has been able to keep, you know, the men in line in Britain for so long is something that, uh, that is something that is worth uh, saluting, essentially. And as you said, five years after she stepped down from political power, That's right. she was still considered was the world's most woman. outstanding yeah. woman. So this lady mm. is somebody we can learn from. And I think that is one of the advantages or the benefits that we are going to get out of this, this interview, to find out how she did, what she did, and why she succeeded, no? You, you know how she got the appellation, the Iron Woman? Iron Lady. S mm -mm. The Iron Lady of others. Mm -mm. She did not get it from Britain. She got it from the Soviets because she was lambasting communism, lambasting Soviet leadership in such a manner to uh -huh. see that the Soviet leadership, hey, and then they said, she is the Iron Lady, and she well, got that appellation. Well, I, you know, it's, uh, do, do you recall what Francois Mitterrand mm. said about her? Yes. She <laughs> said, my goodness, this lady has the lips of Marilyn Monroe and the eyes of Caligula. That's now, right. I don't know how Mitterrand, <laughs> <laughs> how Mitterrand knew what the eyes of Caligula look like, that Roman emperor. But really, this, because the eyes are the window of the soul, and she's really got... Well, that I am afraid of, Winnie, because if I see the eyes of Caligula in that interview, I'm going to freeze. Well, I'm not sure, you know, they thought Caligula was crazy. On the other hand, I, I guess, I, I don't know what he meant, but uh, I will take that as a compliment. <laughs> well, yes. In the case of a Frenchman admitting that she saw in uh, Lady Thatcher the eyes of Caligula, mm -hmm. meant to see that... Uh, even the so-called Gallic composure must have been shaken, you see, in the presence of Lady Thatcher. Well, she <laughs> wasn't, uh, I, I don't think she's a type who will suffer fools gladly. No, not that Francois not. Mitterrand was a fool, you understand. No, yeah. It's just that uh, uh, the, 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 the keenness in, of her mind and the breadth of her, of her knowledge are yeah. such that, that people would, I guess, tremble if they didn't do their homework before facing her, no? But, but Francois... How long did it take you to prepare for this interview, Teddy? Well, it took me a long time to read all three books. You see then that? You talk about Francois Mitterrand. You talk about Francois Mitterrand, about <laughs> Francois Mitterrand no? Oh. Francois Mitterrand was a charmer. 
he had a way with women. They said, you see, that he could seduce even a stone. And probably he well, tried I not seduction. particularly think that that's <laughs> such a fantastic well, attitude whatever. myself. He, prob he probably failed in, you see, charming Margaret Thatcher, and that's why she said she had the eyes ah, of Caligula. No, because Margaret Thatcher yeah. is a very moral person. Very. And she probably, in her lexicon of what the values are, charming women or charming a stone was not yeah. one of them. I guess she did not particularly, uh, she was not particularly impressed by that particular characteristic. And I'm going to tell you, neither am I. <laughs> <laughs> what are you impressed with, Winnie? Huh? Well, I am impressed with keenness of mind and principle and, and the ability to do things uh, and, and get them done as fast as possible with the, the least amount of fuss. I think she had a perfect marriage in Dennis Thatcher because uh, Dennis was not only an intellectual who read a lot of books, mm -hmm. but uh, he was able to give her the kind of advice that nobody else she would give her. Because you see, Dennis Thatcher is secure. He was yeah, a secure, very secure man and secure in his mm. own abilities, etc. It, it would have been, I think, a pity if mm. Margaret Thatcher had married somebody who was insecure and uncertain and inferiority complex, etc., because the, that marriage would have been in, in trouble. So uh, I guess I don't know whether it was Margaret Thatcher's uh, uh, great good fortune that she got somebody like Dennis Thatcher or Dennis Thatcher's great good fortune that he got somebody like Margaret but uh, they seem to have hit it off. And well, Dennis Thatcher, as he said, what a friend, what an advisor, what a pal, what a man. Ayon. 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 What a man. Ayon. 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 Thank you. My first question is this. Lady Thatcher, the English language and the Industrial Revolution sprang from Britain. You have always said that uh, Britain is not simply a European power, but a global power. My question is, what role do you envisage for Britain in the 21st century in terms of securing international peace and progress? I think we have a remarkable history. Uh, we had the beginnings of democracy much earlier than anyone else. We had a remarkable system of a rule of law, which depended upon wonderful wise men giving fair decisions, then writing them down for other people to follow. And early, we came to have our parliament decide 400 years ago on what the law should be. So we have that long history. We also a great seafaring people a great trading people. So we travel the world. In doing that, we kind of, uh, following trade, the flag followed trade. And we built up a great empire. And we taught that empire three things. A non-corrupt professional civil service and administration. Vital. Fewer people better paid mm. are far better than a lot of people ill paid. We taught them a rule of law. They came across to learn the way we did things, because you can't have freedom without a rule of law. And we taught them free enterprise and uh, the way in which to govern. And so we find now that 51 members of the United Nations have been former members of the British Commonwealth, all with uh -huh. this background. And I do think it's a rather wonderful legacy to have passed on. Perhaps our greatest legacy of all yeah. was that the Pilgrim Fathers left our shores and went to build a new life in I America see. because they hadn't at that time full freedom to practice their own religion. We had a Roman Catholic king and he would not let them practice their own particular Quaker religion, so they went for freedom of worship. They took with them all the best that we had in Britain and improved upon it. 
and when they became independent. They elevated things that we had taught, really, to create the greatest country in the world and the greatest defender of liberty. So when you find that the dictatorships the world over try to take freedom away or try to take our land or our people's liberties, it is the Anglo-American alliance that's been the greatest alliance in defense of liberty the world over. And I'm just really rather proud to be British. Lady Patcher, let's go to a subject that also interests you. You have been quite critical of the European Community, its goals. In your view, the architects of the European Community are uh, set to replace the nation state with uh, a federal status. And in your view, no federated system can ever extinguish the reality of a nation state. Would you kindly explain that? When we joined uh, the European Community, we thought we were joining a common market. We wanted a bigger market for the goods of our manufacturers. I wanted them to have as large a market as American manufacturers did for theirs. Uh, so a good home market as well as exports. And it was a European economic community. Now at Maastricht Treaty, they, they, they changed it. So it was called a European Union. And they want us progressively to give up more and more of our parliamentary sovereignty to a parliament that is hardly a parliament at all, and to a big bureaucracy that is the Commission. I didn't think we'd fought the wars of this century to be governed by a bureaucracy. I thought we'd fought them to be governed by our own parliamentary sovereignty and our own uh, rule of law. And so I fight the diminution of Britain's powers. It's taking away the right of people to hold their own members of parliament to account in their own capital city. And I don't think the people want it. And I find that more and more, the separate nations of Europe, the peoples don't want it. There are some, of course, who've never had the kind of stable government and system that we have. They have great difficulty in Spain. Uh, they don't always have a non-corrupt system. They have great difficulty in Italy certain amount of corruption. They have a great difficulty in Greece and there are other poorer countries like uh, the, uh, the Republic of Ireland and they all get very considerable subsidies from the rest of us. Some of those would wish it to continue. I'm quite happy for a, a, an economic community to continue but the world has been saved by the loyalty of people to the nation state. Twice America's come across to save Europe Twice we have been her main ally. Once, before America came into the last war, we stood absolutely alone against Germany. And I can tell you, I was a child. We knew we hadn't a great deal. But it never occurred to us that we might be defeated. Somehow we knew that our way of life, the determination of our people, their love of liberty and our marvelous leader then, Winston Churchill, would prevail. And even Hitler was somehow a bit afraid of that tenacity and sense of purpose of the British people. And America came in as you had the attack here. Yes. I hope that our whole strategy now is to try to spread genuine democracy everywhere. Democracies never attack democracies nor anyone else. It's these terrible dictators, people who love power for the sake of power, they are the trouble. So that is the background. Uh, Lady Thatcher, another subject you have talked about is the shift in the center of economic power in the 21st century from the West to the East. Once Asia becomes an economic colossus, it is assumed that uh, political and military power will follow. If that should happen, would that not pose a serious threat to Europe and the United States? No, I don't think we look upon this as a threat, but as I an see. opportunity. Why should not each and every one of the countries right. and peoples in this region have the opportunities that we take for granted? After all, I suppose the great thing in the history of the world was the uh, discovery uh, of America by the West and the setting up of the whole North and South America. Uh, of uh, a, a, a totally different way of life, mainly North America, because, um, as you know, we tried to introduce democracy and law wherever we went. 
So it's not unusual to have a new great big center. Asia Pacific is not a great monolithic country. Yeah, that's true. It's a varied area with varied peoples, each wanting their own national identity and a better future. And you get a better future by trading all within a free system and having a de democracy. So it's not a threat. It's a great opportunity. The great unknown, of course, is since we've had the collapse of communism yes. in the Soviet Union, and since Deng Xiaoping, even before the collapse of communism, started to free up the economic system, economic enterprise, he'd seen that communism didn't produce prosperity. The great thing about the coming century will how will China use both her great power, she's a nuclear power, and her great wealth. You know the Chinese people are born traders. Yes, they are. Wherever they are in the world. And also, they're very proud of their Chinese identity. I believe that people who are born traders and who like to prosper and concentrate on that. And I think that political and personal liberty will follow the economic liberty that China now has. It has everywhere else in the world then people are interested in building up their freedoms, building up their democracy, and building up a better life. And that's how it should be. We always get some dictators somewhere that we have to watch and we have to guard against. But I hope the main countries of the world will never go to war with one another again. States of America will play a role in maintaining this peace and stability in Asia, holding the nations of East and West into kind of balance, and preventing any nation in Asia from threatening the peace of anybody in this part of the world. Is there any collision course you might foresee or I think about? we have many powerful nations in Asia Pacific. Russia is a very powerful nation militarily, China is very powerful militarily, so is Japan and of course with her great income she's the most prosperous nation in the world she can spend quite a lot on defense so you've got three big powers and you'll have a kind of balance of power there they'll hold it against one another so no one can dominate but America is the most powerful of all she's not the most numerous she's the most enterprising and she's also has this remarkable thing that she can take the latest scientific advances and indeed she discovers many of them she can discover them and she can harness them for the benefit of people and also to keep her military defenses the most advanced the most technologically advanced now that's important in the modern world I usually illustrate it by saying to people doesn't it occur to you the whole history of the world would have been different if Hitler had got the atomic That's weapon first. Yeah. Fortunately, America did. This colossal advance with technology. So she has everything, but she also has been very generous in going the world over to try to free other countries from tyranny. We couldn't have done it alone in Europe. She freed Europe. And it is remarkable that she has this, and we have to be allied to her. She's the most powerful. Her people accept responsibility. She's probably got a higher proportion of really able people capable of taking decisions and guiding things in the future, and of big-minded people than anywhere else in the world. So yes, she will be the lead power. As I often say, even the most powerful nation in the world, uh, even the biggest the most powerful democracy needs friends and it's always been my great pride that during my time as Prime Minister of Great Britain 
I was a great friend of America. I kind of regarded her as um, part of the same family, uh, always. And so, when George Bush and I were together, when Saddam Hussein went into yeah. Kuwait, we said, this terrible aggression must not stand, otherwise it'll start all over the world. And we agreed, both of us, that we would send uh, forces quickly, the air forces there, to stop it. Very quickly. That incursion took place on a Friday. They wouldn't get out over the weekend. The Iraqs wouldn't get out. I was with George Bush on the Monday in the White House, and we agreed that we must go. And immediately I went back, and of course I got it cleared with, with my cabinet. And so we were together, and then we built up an alliance of other nation states. France rang up, and President Mitterrand ringing me up and saying, I haven't been asked to go. I said, well, I'm sure that they're very anxious for you to go. Just, just uh, contact them. So he went. And then George Bush, first time in history, built up mm -hmm. this great alliance. And we all went because it was not only the aggression. That was bad enough. If a dictator got hold of the entire Gulf area, and unless stopped, he would, he'd have been able to blackmail the world because he would have had the ownership or the possession of all of a large portion of the oil supplies. So it does come. Friendship between nations and understanding that friendship involves duties, understanding that freedom involves duties. And I had this one other thing to say. In politics, you never know what will happen. Thatcher's law of politics <laughs> is that the unexpected happens. I woke up one day and was told that the, Falk the, the Argentine fleet was on its way, possibly to invade the Falklands. They invaded them on the Friday because we kept defenses strong. A big task force led by 25 ships was on its way from Britain on the Monday, fully uh, loaded with all the food, all the supplies, and another one from Gibraltar. You never know what's going to happen. <coughs> There's one rule, always be prepared. It's almost the Boy Scouts rule. And so, we always kept our defenses strong. It's important. You never know quite where the next enemy must come from. And you must be prepared to defend those for whom you carry great responsibility. The word, greatest deterrent to a dictator is that he can't get away with it. He'll be toppled. He'll be beaten. And if he thinks, if we think, oh, well, wars are over, now we need to turn have strong defenses. That's the way in which you'll soon find dictators will spring up and cause trouble. Lady Thatcher, what you have just said brings me to a very crucial uh, question. The question of leadership. There's no doubt that your leadership of Britain for 11 and a half years had been unprecedented, but it was also a model of achievement. Now, when does a leader become a good leader or a great leader, what would you say are the essential attributes of good leadership? A good leader obviously means taking strong action. Now, it means people know you'll take strong action and you'll persevere. Now, if you take strong action, and it's very different action from what your country's known before, because you've got the view, as I had, that socialism had got us into great difficulty, you can only be confident that your action is right if it's founded on strong principles. Mine was founded on the belief that governments are there to serve the liberties of the people under a rule of law, under a free enterprise economy, and strongly to defend. After we lost the election in 1974, the Labour government came in. We had departed from our fundamental principles, and I set up a great study with many people not only politicians, but businessmen, uh, academic people, journalists. And we redrafted our whole principles. And from the principles, we decided the policies. And then we sorted out what needed to be done and how it was to be done. And we got into power. That took four years. So I had confidence that we were in the right, and that our programs would eventually achieve the right. Although, as you know, great change means great dislocation. 
we had to cut expenditure. Um, we had to, to, to privatize. Um, we had to get down taxation, so you have to cut expenditure in further ways. We had to cut the bureaucracy. And all of the people objected. And for two and a half years, my name was Mutt. You know, <laughs> I oh, this is, this is too difficult. It's too difficult. It's always difficult to do the right thing. Yes, that's true. But I, my father had taught me to persevere. Um, it's easy to be a starter, but are you a sticker too? It's easy enough to begin a job. It's harder to see it through. And I saw it through. And after three years, all of a sudden, the good things in the economy began to show through. At the same time, we had the Falklands, and against all odds, we won. Although the world thought it was really rather astonishing mm -hmm. that we said Britain sent a fleet 8,000 miles away into the cold, bitter cold Antarctic against a foe that had air cover from land when we only had it from, from aircraft carriers. So the two reinforced one another. But I couldn't have done it unless I'd been confident that I was on the right principles and that if we persisted, it would show through to the benefit of our people. And I was never defeated in an election by the people of my country. That is my proudest boast. Thatcher, different from her predecessors. What made the Grosser's daughter, well, to achieve such a kind of leadership that she was able to put her stamp, not only in Britain, but other events? Is it destiny? Is it what Shakespeare said, that some leaders are born, even at birth? I don't know whether there's any destiny in it, but there was far more than destiny, if such there be, uh, as far as I was concerned. My father had very strong religious views. We were Methodists. Uh, we attended church very regularly. We attended all the activities of the church. He was a man of very strong principle. He was a local councillor. He acted in accordance with principle and was respected for it. Always, he taught us, make up your mind what you believe in. One day, I remember saying to him, look, Father, all my friends are going out for a walk on Sunday night. I would like to go with them. No, we go to service, evening service on Sunday evening. Never do things because your friends are doing them. Always make up your own mind what is right, and then persuade your friends to follow you. So, that was, it was a tough upbringing, but it was right. And he was a splendid example and eventually the political color of our council changed we were conservative and then the labor party got in and always in those days in addition to the elected councillors there was a bench of, uh, of old, older councillors of experience called aldermen who were appointed by the council to be the sort of senior citizens and when the labor party got in they changed that whole bench and they turned my father out uh -huh. and uh, on the whole, people thought we shouldn't react this way. But my father just calmly took off his gown of office and said, in honor, I took it up. In honor, I lay it down. Those things have always stayed with me. It was the best upbringing for any leader, and it can happen to anyone who has wonderful parents Absolutely. who believe in passionately in doing the right thing. Precisely, uh, Lady Thatcher, it brings me to my next uh, question. You have constantly underscored the importance of Christian values as essential to leadership. To quote you, a functioning society cannot be value-free. Since the Philippines is the only Christian country in Asia, would you have some wise words of wisdom for us? 
I would. Human rights really only entered into the political arena about 200 years ago, but they were very much part really of the doctrine of ancient Greece and many other distinguished philosophers throughout history. You see, there are so many political systems who look at things only in terms of economic planning blocks of people. But if you are a believer in the Old Testament, the New Testament, or even in Islam, because those are the three religions that believe in God, you believe that each and every one is important. Each and every one is born different. What a miracle. Each and every one matters to our God. Each and every one has something to contribute. So it doesn't matter where you're born in the world. Each and every one has therefore certain fundamental human rights and fun fundamental human duties. And these should be not a barrier between peoples or philosophies, but a bridge between them. And so you'll find this idea of human rights comes from this remarkable religion, older than Christianity, where the Ten Commandments were addressed to each individual, not to a nation, not to a group, each individual. And that is where the fundamental human rights come from. And the three great religions that are based on the monotheism have that belief in the, uh, uh, in the Ten Commandments. Um, I'm afraid in Islam there are people who call themselves fundamentalists. They're not fundamentalists at all. All the three great religions have had through the centuries people who totally and utterly distorted the meaning of that religion until it bore no relation to religion at all. Yes, we had the Spanish Inquisition. Yes, we had the terrible uh, extremist Jewish people um, uh, attacking and murdering Mr. Rabin. Each of us have an extremist claiming the religion. They are not. What they claim is just evil and has little relation to the underlying religion at all. Lady Thatcher, As, uh, being a woman and a tantage, at a disadvantage when you were Prime Minister, because in 11 and a half years you gave as good as you got, even when some of your critics were calling you that woman, and uh, they were saying, see, that uh, you were Atila de Hen or things like that. But almost always you got the upper hand. Was it more challenging for you and more, shall we say, fulfilling because you were a woman? I don't know. Um, if anyone called me that woman or called me names, I thought, oh, you poor thing, you can't beat me in argument, so you've got to resort to these terrible terms. But that meant that I was better and could beat them in <laughs> argument. But also, I did have an iron will, that's why they called me the Iron Lady. Incidentally, it was the Russians who called me the Iron Lady. They were quite right. And I was just determined to get things done. In some ways, it was an advantage being a woman, because when you were constantly arguing with men and when you were won the argument, it was very much noticed. And also, surely it is in part of the female psyche that you fight intensely for your children. Yes. You really do. More intensely perhaps than anyone else. You know, there's a, there's a, um, a poem by Rudyard Kipling looking at the uh, various animal world and then kind of the female of the species is more deadly than the male. She'll fight stronger for her young. And so I fought for what I believed in. And, um, well, it worked until I'm afraid uh, I had some weaker-hearted brethren <laughs> who couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> that caught the eye. You had absolutely no hesitation of uh, doing a reshuffle or a revamp of your cabinet, even if you had to cut the heads of some of your closest collaborators and even friends. Uh, because to you, what was paramount 
was the welfare of the nation. Now, my question is, uh, wasn't that one of the most difficult tasks of leadership? Did it come to haunt you in the end? Yes, it did. Hmm. The most difficult task of all. You have a lot of ambitious young politicians mm -hmm. wanting to climb the ladder of ambition to become a junior minister, cabinet minister, possibly prime minister. If you leave existing people, no matter how good, in office for a very long time, they don't have a chance. So you have sometimes to call in, usually at least once a year, some of your senior people and say, look, I have to uh, have some changes. And I'm asking you, you've done wonders to relinquish your portfolio. Some of them came and said, look, we've had long enough. We want to go out into the wider world again. It was marvelous. Some seemed to think that uh, they had an endless uh, right to be in that job. And they didn't any more than I did. But what I had to do was to bring on some of the young, bright people. And so I knew that I had to do some of these things. There would occasionally be people who hadn't shown the promise in office. But far more often were people who were friends and good friends and had been loyal. And they might have resented what I had to do. Everyone has to do it, I'm afraid. And it's easier if when you take office you understand that though your party may continue in power, you must have new young people constantly coming up. Just as we did. Yes, 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 yes. Just as we were given a chance right at the beginning. But it's the worst job of all. Yes. Lady Thatcher, in one of your speeches, you say that the English language is soaked in, in the values, values of freedom. And you also said, quote, that is one reason why the dominance of English as the global language of business is also making a contribution to the advance of democracy. Since uh, English is the official language of the Philippines. Could you please talk on that some more? Well, yes, it is. All of our great poetry, some of our greatest poetry of all, is about extolling the virtues of liberty. Uh, whether it's Byron, whether it's Tennyson, uh, whether it is a, a, the great Shakespeare, one after another, they're talking the language of liberty, extolling its virtues, its virtues of bravery, of courage, of standing up for what you believe in. And so it's not surprising that, and also so many of our, um, so much of our literature uh, speaks about it. So it does make a contribution to what I call the mindset of liberty, that this is the natural thing to have, but that liberty carries responsibilities as well. It really is absolutely vital. Uh, Lady Thatcher, in the 11 and a half years you were Prime Minister, you met all the world leaders from west to east. My question is, if you were to name three leaders who you admire the most or who impressed you the most, who would they be? Well, Ronald Reagan, uh -huh. of course, was very strong. He had certain strong beliefs, and he never retreated from them. He was indeed very good. Um, in our own country, of course, Winston Churchill was quite outstanding, a master of the English language. And he used it. You know, never in the history of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. And we thought, wonderful. Um, when we had practically nothing and lost everything, all will be well. Say not the struggle, nor to availeth. The labor and the wounds are vain. The enemy faint not, nor faileth. And then so being as they remain. He went on to the last verse, but westward looked the land its bright. He was marvelous. I think those were two. The person who I worked with very closely, and who was the greatest man of principle, and who helped us to refashion our whole ideals, was a person so little known, Sir Keith Joseph. Sir Keith Joseph. Sir Keith Joseph, he was a cabinet yes, minister yes, yes. Yeah. for a very long time. It was one of he who said, now look, we're going right yeah. back to the beginning, we're going to get the best brains, the best minds, mm -hmm. and we're going to discuss mm -hmm. and test our ideas and values in the court of public opinion. Those three, I think. Another person but little known, who was one, the most, another of the most honorable men I ever knew, was a person who just died, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, Lord yes. Hume, Lord 14th Hume. Earl of Hume. Mm -hmm of family, of great integrity, and 
he was, his family, a great family of noblemen, they had absolutely everything. He, more than anyone else I ever knew, was the most classless man I ever knew. He talked to other people, always the same. He had had everything, therefore he was interested in helping people, interested in people's problems, interested in their talents and abilities. This most remarkable man. It's a pity, lady, that, uh, that we have to end this interview. I just got a signal. It's a tragedy for me because I would have wanted to ask you more questions. And certainly you have the most, you have been the most interesting interview I ever had in six oh. years. Of the <laughs> well, just remember, principles don't change. It's only the circumstances to which they have to be applied. And one great program always was time marches on. But principles, of course, are the same. Thank you very much, Lady Thatcher. This is uh, Teddy Benigno of the Philippine Star. Keep fighting and keep firing. It was a wonderful interview with Lady Thatcher. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. leader, really world class. I find her uh, forceful, I find her determined, I find her with uh, passion, but as a lady, she also delivers it with charm and with grace. Her innate, innate uh, wisdom, her uh, judicious discernment of national and world issues, uh, which uh, have led, uh, I think, the entire people of the world to, to admire her as a very remarkable woman. She has strength of character and independence of mind, which I like very much, a definite vision, and a resolute action. These, I think, are the qualities that make her stand out as a leader, or a woman leader, for that matter. She is an extraordinary woman who always emerges victorious. A forthright person with an air of absolute command. She doesn't mince words in articulating her usually sometimes provocative or even combative views. Well, uh, Winnie, now you have seen Margaret Thatcher in the flesh. What is your immediate and initial reaction? Well, I'm going to tell you. I not only saw her in the flesh, but I saw you interviewing her, and I'm going to tell you. I will tell you what your reaction was. <laughs> you were looking at her. So I caught you. I caught you looking at her with total adoration, <laughs> and I said, heavens to Betsy, the man is starting to fall in love. Really? That's, my, that's my technique. <laughs> technique. Oh, oh, it's all oh, among no, technique. No, no, no. <laughs> that's my technique in interviewing women. They come out anyway, because of that. Anyway. <laughs> in this particular instance I agree with thing. you because this yeah. lady was so fantastic and it just nearly uh, con confirms what I, I uh, thought of her all along did you notice immediately in that 30 minutes yeah. she managed and I and I'm sure it was because of your skill in questioning also she managed to give the philosophy that has that has ruled her life and the philosophy that has ruled her governance of, mm -hmm. of Britain Why? Yep. Mm. What struck me in that interview was that she broke absolutely no nonsense from everyone. And in British Parliament, where you have the sharpest tongues and the sharpest minds, she was not only able to hold her own, but, as a matter of fact, take the upper hand I, in the I, with them. I take particularly delight, yeah. I particular delight in her, in her dismissal of the names and the, the, the horrible words with which she was described by her enemies or her critics in Britain. Now she said, well, that's because I, they cannot win an argument that's with right. me, yeah. so they must depend on, ad, well, what I would consider ad hominem arguments, talking about 
that woman. In other words, uh, uh, when they couldn't win on arguments, they will win on, 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 on talking about, uh, about physical characteristics or other personal characteristics. So that to me is a measure of her success. Yes. And uh, what is amazing is that uh, having been the Prime Minister for 11 and a half years, and you know how it is to see in Parliament, in Britain, nobody is ever free from any kind of criticism. It's a free-for-all and the backbenchers pour everything they want, all the scorn, all the criticism they want on uh, the Prime Minister. And almost all the time she was able to hold her own. Because she had principles. Her upbringing, mm. I was particularly also impressed with that. When you were asking her the question about, uh, was it destiny? Yung mga yeah, yeah. Naka, nakaguhit ba sa tadhana? O, ano yung gulong ng palad? Sort yeah, of yeah. Sabi niya, if it's destiny, it's a very small part. Yeah. A lot of it is the upbringing and the kind of training she had mm. from, from, from childhood to uphold the principle. And I just wish that the, the viewers, who are the, our television viewers, take that to heart because it wasn't uh, what her friends were doing or, or the regard of her peers that was important. It was what she thought was right. And that was something that her father uh, sort of uh, inculcated in her and which has absolutely ruled her life yeah. and ruled it very well. Two he things she was inculcated in. One, the rigor of the Methodist religion in which she was brought up the father was very much involved in the Methodist rituals of the community, which was uh, Grantham. Mm -hmm. was Grantham, and the mother was also. But the father also taught her, not only taught her, but encouraged her to read. And she read and read and read while other girls played in the courtyard. And she was telling in her book that there were some books that were forbidden to her by her father. But her curiosity got in the way. Binasa Binasa Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the forbidden fruit is always the yeah. one that is tastier, mm. hindi ba? But uh, uh, more with respect to uh, what we can learn from her with respect to governance, what is that alarm that you or me, hmm. neither of us? Well, Napunamo, the very first thing she said, the moment, you know, practically the first words that came out of her mouth in your interview about the secret of Britain's success exactly, as a world yeah. power. Mm -hmm. Number one, a non-corrupt and an exactly. efficient civil service. That's right. I think we should take 10,000 pages from that particular yeah, book, yeah, huh? Yeah. Uh -huh. Because she said that was, what did she say? Civil service, free enterprise, and uh, liberty. I mean, yeah, the, the, rule of law. the rule of law. The rule of the law. Rule of law. And uh, I think uh, that those are very good uh, standards to live by. Civil service, do we have that? A non-corrupt and efficient civil service. Number two, the rule of law. Heavens, if we could only have that. And of course, free enterprise. Now, what is amazing about her was that uh, whenever she felt she had to revamp or reshuffle her cabinet, and she did that about four, five, six, seven times, no? She would call them, and without hesitation, she would tell them, I'm sorry, you're out. Another page you're from out. her book. Mm. Friendship had nothing Friendship to do had with it. Do. Loyalty yeah, had loyalty. nothing to do mm. with it. It had to be strictly what you could do. Mm. And of course, giving in to the other, yeah. to the younger people who are ready to go up. Wow, you know, if we could just uh, do that. Do you see me you're out in six months? Huh? You're out now. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking principles here. We are not talking. We are not comparing. Let us not make this odious <laughs> comparison. <laughs> You're reading something about what I was saying. But I, 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 I think that, uh, that to the extent that what she did was, was uh, instrumental in getting Britain out of the economic doldrums, yeah. and to the extent that what she did, obviously, was was with the approval of the populace then these are indeed secrets that yeah. are not only politically uh, good but they are also economically yeah. uh, good in other words to me the yeah. best economic the best politics is good yeah. economics and that's what she did you know did you did you did you notice they took four years from 1974 to 1978 yeah. that party took four years to rethink and redraft exactly. their principles yeah. and say this is what we are going to live by when we get in 
And by God, that is what they lived by when they got here. Not by you God, God words, hand it to exactly her. exactly the kind of expression and planning. for Margaret Thatcher. Everything about her was by golly and by God. <laughs> <laughs> we no. pause for a brief break. should be able to have a good sense of the task or the work uh, on hand and a sense of the people who are involved. And uh, a woman is able to combine that uh, a lot better, I think, than men. Uh, a woman is basically a, a very practical problem solver on a day-to-day on -day basis. She, she meets problems, she has to solve them, she has to solve them quickly. And that's very good training for for leadership. A strong woman, uh, a woman who was able to uh, bring in uh, some needed reforms uh, in her country, uh, which some of which would be applicable uh, to our own economy today, but some of which I think uh, we just cannot swallow a hook, line, and sinker. But um, in my case, I always um, welcome uh, like a, a breeze of, of uh, fresh air. Uh, visitors like Lady Thatcher. Well, Mawini, another surprising thing about uh, Margaret Thatcher, Lady Thatcher, is that from her early childhood, she was a very pretty child. Ang ganda ganda ng bata. All stages from 10 to 12, 14, 16, she was not just a beauty, she was a dazzling beauty. No. And yet, and yet, you could never imagine that her kind would enter politics and make good. You could never imagine her type would have that kind of character, that kind of discipline. Excuse me, why? Do you think that beauty and brains don't mix? They do. Pero alam mo naman mga ganda. Napaka-chauvinistic mo naman. Excuse me. Madadala sa mga, madadala sa mga prom yan. Depen madadala sa mga depende kwat. Depende naman. Madadala sa mga barkada. Eh, ayan kasi si yung mga tipo na mga old oh, fogies oh, oh, na men. Oh. They think kung maganda yung bata, huwag nang mag-iisip miski oh, ano. Oh. Kasi, In, kasi ikakasal na lang. Thank God she had a father like that. Hindi sumama sa mga barkada. Hindi nakipag body body or chum chum uh -oh. she was really very independent pero wala i mean are, are are we going to spend the whole time analyzing all her good points or are we going to bring in some of the some of the negatives why don't you with bring it up respect to the interview let's see well, if i can reinforce you i think you. one of the uh, one of the things that struck me as being uh, maybe not so good was uh, number one mm -hmm. her na sobra naman ang pagka fan club niya sa america mm -hmm. napuna mo ba but, Reagan, uh, Reagan. Uh, well, mm. Reagan and, and America, yeah. and, yeah, and yeah. certainly yeah. America has that kind yeah. of role. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, you know, I mean, in the defense of liberty, etc., etc., I mean, let's face it, real politics has it, mm. that America did a lot of what it did because it had its own agenda yeah. to yeah. follow. So let's not get uh, carried away. That was one thing that I noticed, the rather, the rather effusive enthusiasm which she displayed for America but I guess that can be <laughs> that can be mm -hmm. pardoned because she considers America but the child of Britain so mm -hmm. talagang parang yung proud parent that this this child is doing so well but but the feeling the admiration was mutual between her and Reagan that's right there was a picture of Reagan with Margaret Thatcher mm -hmm. and the dedication of Reagan was mm -mm. dear Margaret I agree with everything you say, Ronald Reagan. So mutual well, admiration in the law. Oh, oh, that's true. Well, uh, uh, and the second thing that I, I did notice, of course, as former prime minister and as sort of a, mm. a diplomatic, uh, um, I mean, an ambassador of goodwill, etc., she's never going to say, and now what is wrong with Britain? 
but uh, but uh, notice that she kept on saying that Britain was was uh, was inculcating principles of democracy, etc. Remember, India had a hard time getting its independence from Britain. Yeah. I mean, Britain was brought there by sheer force. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the, the 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 memory is selective sometimes. But uh, no one is perfect, and this girl, this lady, is more perfect than. Uh, more perfect than most, or less imperfect than most. I well, yes, you, I do agree with you because uh, she saw only the positive aspects of uh, British colonialism. Mm -hmm. And I remember in what is now Singapore, uh, some of the... Wait, uh, I eh, uh, 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 British accent in na? Singapore. Uh, was that no dogs or non Englishmen allowed? Yeah, right. Uh, 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 that's right. So, uh, so uh, those are the things that that it was very mm, conveniently yeah. ignored. Uh, but uh, on the whole, she she painted with a very broad brush, and mm. she tried to be as uh, favorable as possible uh, to to her country, which she obviously loves so dearly, and to the United States, which she loves uh, uh, second dearly. But um, mm -hmm. But ang lakas ng kanyang dating, ano ha? Did you, did you, do, do you recall what she said about the fundamentalists? Yeah. Saying that this was, has nothing to do with religion. Wow, that's really telling the it, ha? Fanatics, huh? sinabi niya. Oh, <laughs> na, I, I, my goodness, I, baka ma, baka ma, kung ano ang gagawin ng mga Muslim fundamentalists sa kanya. Because she said that that, fun, that kind of fundamentalism, had absolutely nothing to do with the religion that they claim to be defending or to <laughs> they claim to be practicing, and it's just sheer unmitigated evil. Wow, them strong words. Who? Then probably, I mean, since we're looking at Margaret Thatcher as a whole, and uh, since uh, I belong to the opposite sex, I would have found it very, very hard to have worked under Margaret Thatcher, because... Uh, Try it, it's a g fantastic position. Yeah, I know, but she's the type of woman who, once she has made up her mind, will not allow you, as a matter of fact, you see, to have your say. But uh, she has made up her mind, it's finished. She will debate with you in the beginning. Pag natapos na, wala na. Pero Hindi Jean, ka na Sandri, mm. Mm. But that is her as a leader. In yeah. other words, kasi the buck stops yeah. with her. Yeah. So it is, in, you know, it is absolutely uh, in, important that she get all these mm. inputs in. Mm. But at some point in time, she's got to make a decision. And once she makes a decision, that's it, baby. Wala na mga flip-flopping dito at mm -hmm. flip-flopping doon. That's uh, that's where the the problem sometimes lies. The problem lies with the with the the information, the you know the wrong information that or the very poor information that you get, and then you make a decision so fast, and then you you keep on changing and changing and changing. This lady gets all the information she can, gets all the input she can, and then afterwards she's willing to take all the you know she's taking all the responsibility, and she says that's it folks, the time has that, come. That's right. Wow. She stands okay on, na okay sa akin yan. She stands on her mountain and she says, that's it, folks. There's no way by which I can change my mind. We have talked about it. This uh, is a decision. Let's go forward. That's but, the way but, it is. Yeah, I, 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 I admire that, mm. but, but only because this before she makes a decision, she makes sure that she gets all the yes, possible inputs, mm. and then she applies her principles. I like that last statement of hers. Huh? The principles don't change. I it's knew you would like that, Winnie. I knew that would be right the, up the alley them. of Solita Monso. <laughs> On that note, we will pause for another break. <laughs> saying there were some other things you wanted to bring out regarding uh, Lady Thatcher or Margaret Thatcher in order to round up, you see, our reaction to that interview. 
Ano ba yun? Well, you know, ano ang kanyang, ano ang kanyang summary? That's good for the government. Civil service got to be improved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rule of law got to be improved. Mm -hmm. Decisive leadership. Yung sinasabi yeah. niya, before you take an action, be uh, understanding, and then when you take an action, stick to it. Sabi niya, it's easy to be starters. It is hard to be stickers. In other words, you got to stick to it. Yeah. And, and she showed that it could yeah. be done. Hindi ba? I mean, for two and a half years, her name was Mud, and then the economy uh, went uh, went up, and she she rode that crest. Yeah. Okay? So, uh, principles. Principles to mm. me are very, uh, for her, are very important, and I think it should be for all of us. It's a pagkalalaki niya. Hey, no! Pagkalalaki niya. Them's fighting words. Lumabas baby. doon sa Falklands. Anong pagkalalaki? Oh, Ang oh. pagkababain oh, okay. niya. Okay, but then, you, can call it, you can call it anything you want. It's no? sure lang. But I remember uh, that when the Falklands crisis exploded, uh, uh, they thought, you see, that Margaret Thatcher could not handle it uh, because she was a woman. Yeah, they, they, uh, because uh, they did not realize what a woman precisely. is. Remember what she said, the female psyche precisely. is more intense uh, and is willing to fight for uh, anything for her young. And as far as Margaret Thatcher was concerned, those Falkland Islands were her. Precisely, were her but nobody ah. ever imagined that she had the courage the audacity, oh. the resourcefulness, the resolution to go out Kasi there and send the British fleet. Ito yeah. mga macho macho men, eh, akala nila sila lang ang <laughs> matitigas dyan. Eh, hindi nga hindi nila kaya, nun. kaya si Margaret eh, Thatcher mo. lang kumaya. Eh, oh. hindi mo lang, you don't even have to look at Margaret yeah. Thatcher, all you had to do was look at Cory Aquino oh. and how she stood up. You know, remember when, when, when Marco said she belongs in the bedroom? Ay, nako. I, re I remember mm. Enoch Powell uh -huh. stood up in Parliament. Ha, 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 he said. Now, we will see what kind of metal Margaret Thatcher is made of. Iron. <laughs> ah, iron, the answer. And it turned out that the iron lady was yeah. really the iron lady. Well, but we, before we end, I'd really like to congratulate you, Teddy, on the kind of questions you asked, which drew out, and for the, for the viewing public, essentially, a very good portrait in 30 minutes of the woman and what she was like. I uh, salute you for Thank that. Thank you. And of course, I salute Coming from you, that's really a compliment. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> on that note, we will have to bid goodbye on this very interesting, exclusive interview with Margaret Thatcher. This is Teddy Benigno, Philippine Star. Keep firing and keep fighting. And this is Winnie Monsot of the University of the Philippines. Remember that in firing line, you can call a spade a spade, and Margaret Thatcher does. <laughs>
each and every one has therefore certain fundamental human rights and fun fundamental human duties. And these should be not a barrier between peoples or philosophies. But I just remember, principles don't change. It's only the circumstances to which they have to be applied. And one great program always was Time Marches On.